Hey guys, it is Sam again. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe, because I know these are crazy times. Now I know that it can be a lot to handle sometimes, so do not forget to take care of yourselves. Maybe Swamp Dweller's channel is one place where you can do that, and if so, then I am happy that I can help you guys out with my stories. Every little bit counts. For me, writing my experiences out has helped me to process my past more, both the good and bad parts. I have kept a lot of intense things to myself or in my journals, and it has been good to get some of those things heard by such a wide audience. My family and loved ones help by listening to me, but it is different than thousands of people hearing me out. It also makes me happy to be able to educate others, so hopefully you guys are also learning when you are listening to these letters. Anyway, I am not done teaching yet, so I hope you are ready for more. Let us start by getting into this letter's Q&A section. Somebody said that I should write a book about my experiences and knowledge. I have been told this a couple of times since I started sending my letters to Swamp Dweller, and I think it might be a good idea. I do not know much about how to get published, but I am pretty sure I could figure it out with some help. On the other hand, I am not sure how the hunters would respond to something like this. I do not think the organization would completely block my book from being published, but there would certainly be resistance to it. There has been a bit of resistance to these letters, in fact, but so far nobody has really tried to actively stop me. After all, writing for someone who reads stories on YouTube is different from publishing a book. Anyway, writing a book is certainly something to consider. Are there any peaceful or docile cryptids? Yes, absolutely. Monsters are mostly like animals. Some are more aggressive than others, although they can pretty much be all aggressive if they need be. But many are peaceful. In my very first letter, I talk about Sasquatch and how they are usually quite gentle. Many of the more intelligent humanoid cryptids are not inherently hostile, including fairies, little people, and others. Even some predatory creatures do not often attack humans, like Makara. Check out the previous letter to learn more about them. And some monsters just do not really pose much of a threat to humans, like the Veo of Indonesia. Veo looks like the animals called pangolins, and although they are excessively big, maybe a little scary looking, they have never attacked humans that I know of. So just like the animals, there are some cryptids out there that are more aggressive than others. Now, I just talk about the dangerous ones because they are the ones the hunters usually must deal with, since they are the ones that cause dangerous problems for humans. Plus, some of the most popularly known cryptids are the dangerous ones, and I know people would like to hear about them. And then of course, I'd like to keep you safe and give you some information on more common or dangerous creatures you might come across. How do hunters deal with guns being illegal? <laughs> this is a little funny because this issue comes up in the US surprisingly rarely. Our gun laws are a little crazy, to be honest. You can get away with a lot of stuff here. Racial profiling is a sad reality, so people with darker skin like me do have to be more careful and more aware. It is not like I get stopped by the police all the time. It is just an extra reason to be cautious and mindful when I am out there. I have been detained and questioned before, though and in those situations, I was able to show my hunter badge and move on without further incident. I also usually only carry about three guns at a time, so I am not illegally selling mass quantities of anything. I have a hunch that Sergio and other guides call ahead or otherwise notify law enforcement in the areas where hunters are assigned. Maybe not, but I just have a feeling that's what they do. But whatever they do, hunters are normally able to use the badge and other documentation of our organization to deal with police and law enforcement all over the world. Like I said, the whole gun issue comes up primarily outside of the US. We often ship our guns or fly privately into other countries to avoid the usual security hassles. Although that has only really been an issue inside the past 20 years or so, but wherever hunters go, most of our operations tend to take place far away from the areas where you would normally encounter law enforcement. So we do not often cross paths with them as much. The problems usually crop up when traveling from place to place. Good question though. How do the inner logistics of the hunters work? How are the hunters organized? Pretty loosely if we are being honest. I cannot give away too much, but this is another good question. So I will share a few of the most basic 
less confidential details. As far as I know, the highest level of our organization is known as the Circle, with a capital C. It sounds odd, or even a little silly, I know, but I think the name comes from centuries ago, and it's just never changed. The Circle has nine members, and although I can't tell you who they are, they come from all over the world and work jointly to oversee the organization. Picture a board of directors from another group or association, and that's pretty similar to what the Circle is. I won't go into how Circle members are appointed to their positions, but the process is relatively democratic. Beneath the Circle is the Lodge with a capital L. Again, I think it was named after old European hunting traditions. The Lodge includes a variety of people, including the Keepers. The Keepers are like regional managers. Each one is responsible for overseeing a big geographical region, similar to the way the United Nations divides the globe. For example, there is a Central Australian Keeper and a Horn of Africa Keeper. Then, below the Keepers are the Tenders, with a capital T. The Tenders oversee major subdivisions of different countries, like states, provinces, or regions. For example, there is an Alberta Tender and an Argentine Patagonia Tender. In practice, all the members of the Lodge have little effect on the day-to-day -day operations of any given hunter. Lodge members are mostly responsible for putting together policy and regulations, and for making sure that hunters are acting in the best interests of humans, monsters, and the organization overall. For example, a tender might put out a call for assistance, as I mentioned in my Wendigo and Dear People letter. But when it comes to the average hunter doing their job, the higher-ups mostly give us free reign. Unless we do something that goes against the rules or seriously threatens the safety of the public or the environment. Phew, that was a long answer. But hopefully now you have a better idea of how our organization is set up. Alright, now let's get into the location focus section of Q&A. This time I was asked to talk about some of the creatures that you can find in Scandinavia. As you might imagine, there are quite a few different monsters in this region. There are so many forests, caves, mountains, and coastlines, and places like these offer great habitats for all sorts of wildlife, including cryptids. The most well-known Scandinavian creature would probably be the troll. These enormous humanoids live primarily in areas without much human settlement, living off wild game and fish. There are a few subspecies of troll, but none are well-known for their intelligence or manners. Unlike the folktales, they don't wear clothes, they don't speak any human language, and they don't really care what religion you subscribe to. The largest trolls can be well over 50 feet tall, and that would be the closest thing you'd find to a giant. Some medieval hunters actually even refer to these things as being giants. There are also a variety of aquatic creatures in the lakes, rivers, and fords of Scandinavia. Several different kinds of giant serpent inhabit the coast and lakes of the area as well as some species of enormous fish. The Nock is the Scandinavian counterpart of the Nixie, although in Scandinavia they seem to be mainly male rather than female. Nokken inhabit freshwater locations such as streams and waterfalls. They are much more common in Scandinavia than in other parts of Europe because of the relative lack of polluted waterways, but they're still elusive and poorly understood, even by the hunters and of course, werewolves and vampires can be found in the Nordic countries as well. There are a few other types of monsters that inhabit the region, but those are some of the main ones. Now I will talk about some of the creatures which you guys have mentioned, but which aren't the topic of this letter. When Swamp did the t-shirt giveaway along with the Thunderbird letter, he required a comment as part of the criteria for entering. So on that video in particular, you guys mentioned a lot of different monsters that you would like to hear about. As I'm writing this, there are apparently over 800 comments, and most of them mention some cryptid that you'd like to hear about. I obviously can't write letters about all 800, or even address all of them here in the Q&A, but I'll try to give some quick information about some of the ones that seem to be the most popular or commonly mentioned. Feline cryptids from South America. Well, there are not many of these. Most reported feline cryptids on the continent are just misidentified jaguars. However, South America is home to what we know as the water cat. 
Water cats are sometimes called water tigers, but since they aren't actually tigers at all, the former name is the one used by the hunters. They also have several local names such as Aipa or Yakaru. Water cats are members of a large semi-aquatic feline species that is somewhat like the jaguar. Water cats don't have spots, though their tails end in tassels, so they're able to be distinguished from jaguars by sight alone. They also have long fangs that almost resemble the canine teeth of saber-toothed cats. Water cats are rare and elusive, like most cat species, but they have populations all over South America. Stickmen, like skimwalkers, they're generally taboo to speak about these things among many native communities. The name stickmen, or stick Indians, is an English invention, but it is how the hunters usually refer to these creatures. This is because they have a few names in native languages, but much like walkers, it's considered bad luck and taboo to say these. Out of respect for this belief, I'm not going to say any of those native names, and I'm not going to talk much about stick Indians. They are essentially malevolent forest spirits. One type is very tall, and the other is very small, but in overall appearance, they mostly resemble the native people of the northwestern United States. The small kind are different species from the other North American dwarf creatures known as the Little People. Stick Indians live in the western half of the US, and thankfully, they are very rare nowadays. Hunters have fought and killed many of them, although Stick Indians will sometimes play relatively harmless pranks on campers and travelers alike, they have also killed many people by getting them lost in the woods or by outright attacking them. They have driven many others insane, psychologically destroying them after luring them into the forest. Stick Indians are incredibly fast and strong, and can wield weapons just like humans. I've never met one myself, and I hope to keep it that way. I could give a lot more detail, but again, you really shouldn't talk about Stick Indians much at all, so I'll leave it at that. The Hideous Kardashian Cryptid I can't say I know much about this particular monster, I don't follow modern pop culture too much, as a hunter, I deal with enough craziness and stupidity already. Banshees. These fey creatures are found all across Ireland and are also known as the Wailing Woman. Banshees are not human ghosts, however, they're just one of the many types of fairy. The Banshee is very closely related to the Scottish Cunyak. Banshee appearances have dwindled significantly over the centuries and they're very rarely seen in the modern day. It's not entirely clear why this is, but most hunters believe that it's connected to the overall worldwide decline of fairies and other cryptids that started along with the Industrial Revolution. Banshees vary in size from very tall to very short, but usually appear as smaller than human adults. They scream in the nighttime, wailing medieval death laments to the families and people who have recently died or are about to die. But even though banshees are associated with death, they are not necessarily malevolent. In a sad sort of way, they grieve along with the families of the dead, but not much is known about banshees since they only ever appear to most humans at specific times. In any case, they're not dangerous or aggressive that I know of, and you'll probably never see one in your lifetime. But be thankful if you don't. Anyways, I think that's enough Q&A for now. As always, I hope you learned something new, and I'll continue reading and responding to your questions in the next letters. So if you have any questions about pretty much anything, I'm open. But now, let's get into the main cryptid that I'll be talking about for this letter. This time, we're going to be talking about the Imela Tuca. Unusual name, I know. This name comes from the Bamu Tiba, language of the Republic of Congo in Central Africa. In Bami Tiba, the name Emelatuka means two things. First, it means eater of the tops of the palm trees. Second, it means elephant killer. Both meanings should already give you an idea of the Emelatuka's size and power. Emelatuka live in the western part of Central Africa, primarily in Cameroon and the Republic of the Congo. They are a species of giant reptile, but in appearance and behavior, they are like rhinoceroses. The Melatuka have thick skin covered in scales, and they often vary in color, ranging from sandy tan to light gray to leafy green. 
They have thick bodies supported from underneath by four sturdy legs and muscular tails that stretch behind them for balance. Their heads end in beak-like mouths, like a snapping turtle's jaws. The Melatuka also have two leathery flaps that resemble miniature elephant ears on the sides of their heads. These flaps are not wearing, though. Hunters call them frills, and they function for display and communication purposes. A Melatuka can flush their frills with blood to turn them red in color, and we will talk about this later. The most distinctive feature of a Melatuka are their horns, which stick up vertically from their noses, just like rhino horns. Each Melatuka has one, single large horn they use for self-defense and display purposes. These horns can grow up to several feet in length. Speaking of length, a Melatuka are not quite as large as the legends say. Adults of the species stand between seven and eight feet tall and measure about 25 feet long, including their tails. So they are not as big as elephants per se, or at least not as tall as them. And as some tales claim, overall, a Melatuka very closely resemble the dinosaurs known as Ceratopsians, just without the bony frills at the backs of their skulls. Some hunters believe that Amelatuka are direct descendants of those dinosaurs, and that they survived up until the present day. However, Ceratopsians did not come from the area that is now Africa, as far as we know anyway. Then again, I guess they would have had 65 million years to move. In any case, I think that Amelatuka probably evolved separately from dinosaurs, but who knows? In terms of their behavior and lifestyle, Amelatuka are like modern African rhinos, except they live in swampy, forested areas instead of the drier savannas or scrubland. This habitat is part of the reason Amelatuka are so elusive, despite their huge size. It is not easy to get deep into the parts of the swamp and rainforest where Amelatuka live, not to mention the on and off warfare that's cropped up in the Congo region over the past several decades. So Amelatuka are not as well studied as the other species of monsters out there. However, we do know a bit about them. Amelatuka eat mainly leaves and fruits, and every so often, just like their name says, they will stand on their hind legs or knock over palm trees to eat the tops of them. Amelatuka are mostly solitary and have never really been observed in large groups. On the rare occasions that there are more than one together, it usually seems to be a mother and her offspring. Hunters have also observed males fighting, but this does not seem to be common. The breeding and reproduction habits of Amelatuka are unknown, since there do not seem to be many of them out there. They probably do not give birth very often, and probably only have one or two babies at a time. We do not know if they lay eggs or not, although they probably do like other large reptiles, Melatuka are most known for their horns, which can both be used for combat and for display. Like rhinos, a Melatuka are incredibly bad-tempered and will attack almost anything with extraordinarily little warning or provocation. They have better vision than rhinos, and that does not change their tendency to charge first and ask questions later. Once they started a charge, there's not much that can honestly stand up to an Amelatuka. Even African forest elephants, which have no predators besides humans, fall victim to Amelatuka horns. And this is where the second meaning of the name Amelatuka comes from. These creatures can indeed be elephant killers. And that is why in late 2005, Heather's guide, a man named Callum, contacted her about some strange events in the Republic of the Congo. Heather and I moved in together only a few months after we had started our relationship. Although I had been more than willing to pack up and move to Ireland, it eventually wound up that she came to live with me in Oklahoma. We did a little bit of everything. Lots of hikes, visits to my family, traveling out of state, you know, just stuff like that. It was in bed, one of these times, that I first told Heather I loved her, and you can probably imagine how I felt when she said the same thing to me. It was not like we started planning our lives together then and there, but I would be lying if I said that the idea did not cross my mind for a moment. I was 32 years old and lots of people get married earlier than that, after all. But I am not planning on giving up hunting anytime soon, 
so when Heather got the call from Callum about the Congo, I was ready to go. Heather and I had been on numerous hunts together by that point, and we had worked damn well with each other. I also hadn't been to Africa much, so I wanted to come with her. According to Callum, there were some odd reports coming from people over there in the western positions of the Central African rainforest. They had been finding various dead animals in the areas they were studying. Ordinarily, this would be nothing unusual, of course, but these animals were from species that normally don't just get killed off. Several adult African forest buffalo and forest elephants had turned up dead, despite these animals having no real predators besides humans in the area. But the dead elephants were not missing their tusk or anything like that, so it obviously wasn't ivory poaching. And neither the elephants nor the buffalo had been eaten, so it wasn't brush meat hunting. Besides, no rational human goes after such a large and dangerous animal, for me anyways. That's just a death sentence. The deaths could have been due to disease or old age, but all the dead animals had mostly appeared healthy and fit. However, some reports spoke of puncture wounds on the corpses, and that is where the hunters took notice. A melatuka are rare and powerful, and the hunters would not want any aggressive ones roaming the forest and threatening other vulnerable species like elephants. Worse, if there was an aggressive Amelatuka in the area, then the researchers could be in danger as well. So pretty soon, Heather and I were on the ground in Brazzaville, the capital city of the Republic of the Congo. It was humid, since we'd arrived in the peak of the rainy season, and when we stepped outside from the airport, I immediately felt like I walked into a hot shower that had just been turned off. I shook my head to Heather. I have never enjoyed heat or humidity, and I didn't like this. We were almost on the equator, so I had been expecting this sort of climate, but even so, it wasn't pleasant. It's too hot, and I simply told Heather, who just laughed. You're going to love it here even when it starts raining, she replied, and I remember groaning at that thought. Heather was from Ireland, of all places. How was she handling this climate better than me? We found our car. After that, and we were greeted by a lean but muscular man who introduced himself as Kembo. Kembo was a little younger than Heather and I, and he wasn't a hunter. Instead, he worked with the group of researchers that were going to visit for information. I cannot tell you what institute or organization these scientists were from, but they were a mixed group. Most were from the general west and central Africa region, and a few came from even further away places and overseas. Their job was mostly to study local elephant populations in the northern part of the country. Again, for privacy and security, I'm not going to tell you exactly where, but we were headed to that location, which was where the most recent elephant and buffalo deaths had taken place. The plan was to get some information from the researchers, then go out onto the hunt. It would probably be rough, especially without someone who knew the area firsthand, but I was confident that Heather and I would get through it. First, we were going to consult the scientist, and we were going to ask them questions and maybe even get some extra supplies if need be. Second, Heather had been to the forest of West Africa before, and she knew a bit about the environment, and even if it was not, like my home turf, I still knew how to survive outdoors as well. And third, we were as well equipped as we could be. We had brought a sturdy tent, plenty of food and water, and of course, our weapons. We'd also read up on the general area and asked some questions to other hunters who had been here before, so we were pretty much as ready as we could be. We helped Kembo pack our stuff up into his jeep, and then we hit the road to head straight for the research base. It took a long time to get there, since we practically had to cross the country Brazzaville is all the way in the south, and we needed to go pretty much north. The jeep bumped steadily along, and although I managed to keep my eyes open for an hour or so after leaving the big city, it wasn't long before Heather and I were both out cold, leaning against each other in the back seat. I woke up a little while later to find it getting dark, and before long, we were driving through thick tree cover. Soon we pulled up to the clearing in the trees, and Kembo told us that we had arrived. The research base was almost an assembly of big canvas tents on the edge of the forest clearing. These were very large, semi-permanent tents, like the kind used by the military or seen in field hospitals. 
There was also a shack-like building made of wood with an open pavilion structure with a stone floor and a thatched straw roof. Everything was well lit with electric lanterns and portable lights, but it didn't seem to be very busy. A few people were sitting underneath the pavilion, talking and eating dinner, but I assumed most people were in their tents. Heather and I hopped out of the jeep, and Kembo took us to the pavilion. There, he introduced us to the people. One of them was the leader of the research expedition. She didn't want to be named here, so let's just call her Ava. She was from the nearby country of Gabon, and she welcomed us to sit down for dinner. Heather and I brought food, but Ava insisted that we eat with her and the other researchers. I wanted to keep our distance as much as possible so that we wouldn't have to deal with as many questions, but eventually Heather accepted. So we had a meal of mashed plantains and chicken with the researchers, and Ava told us that we could ask her any questions we had. I mainly used the meal to get an idea of the land and the different environments around us. As expected, we were pretty much surrounded by nothing but forest. There were some open savanna type areas to the east, but in almost all other directions, the terrain was thick jungle. Heather asked about swamps and apparently there was indeed some marshland to the north. Since Heather had told me that the Amelatuka liked swampy areas, I figured that was probably where our target would be. The scientist asked us a few questions about ourselves, which we answered as quickly and as confidentially as we could. Basically, we just said that we were from a global organization and we were here to look into the recent animal deaths. The researchers seemed a bit concerned and even suspicious, but I couldn't blame them. I figured Sergio or Callum might have contacted them before our arrival, but even so, Heather and I still weren't giving them all the details. They had every right to be wary of us, but I knew that once we dealt with the Amelatuka, they would feel a lot better about our presence, even if they didn't know exactly what took place. When we brought up the topic of the dead animals, the scientists all got very quiet and very serious. We were finished eating by that point, so Ava took us into the biggest tent of the camp, which was set up as a command center or headquarters of sorts. There were lots of desks, shelves, cabinets, and papers, as well as a few computers. Ava took us to one computer and pulled up some images for us. They were aerial GPS maps of the area, marked with little dots and corresponding coordinates that indicated where the corpses had been found. Most of the dots were clustered together in a place that was north where the camp was marked. So each dot matches with a set of coordinates, and that's one site where you found a dead animal, I asked. Correct. These are the locations where all the bodies were discovered. All the casualties have either been buffalo or elephant. Each was somehow killed. We know this because we found distinctive wounds on the bodies, Ava explained. When we pressed her for more information on the wounds, Ava said that it looked like dead animals had been stabbed. Each of them had at least one large puncture wound on its body, usually in a vulnerable spot like the stomach or the chest. One elephant had been gored through the neck. Ava empathized that the stab wounds were exceptionally large, as if made by a large pole or something of a, like, the size of a tree. She and the other researchers had been baffled and genuinely concerned, and I could understand why. Elephants and buffalo are huge and powerful animals, and they do not just get randomly stabbed to death. I asked Ava if she had any tracking experience. She said she knew a little bit, but they should really ask Kembo about that since he was one of the lead trackers. I made a note of that in my head and then asked if Ava had noticed anything unusual, especially in the area around the bodies. I was wondering if she had seen any Amelatuka sign, although I obviously wasn't going to just ask her that up front. She said that she had noticed many footprints around the bodies, but that didn't mean much. Both elephants and buffalo are social animals, so their herds could have left footprints around the corpses if they had come over to investigate or grieve. Heather and I figured that was all the info we'd get from Ava for now, and we were getting tired, so we said goodbye. We went to find Kembo next. He gave us some more information about specific dead bodies and where they had been found, and also noted that it looked like a struggle had clearly taken place around most of the corpses. The ground had been churned up all around the bodies, leaving few clear footprints. I figured if they had been charged by the Amelatuka, then the elephants and buffalo might have tried to fight back if possible. 
ultimately it seems they lost. Kembo almost noted that most of the killings took place in and around the swamps to the north, something that we had seen on the pictures Ava had shown us. Finally, Kembo told us that he had found trails in the marshes that might have been elephant trails, but were different somehow. When he described seeing frequent gashes on the trees, which elephants may leave with their tusk, but not as often as this, Kembo said that the gashes resemble marks made by the rhinoceros' horn, but he knew very well that rhinos didn't even live in the country in the first place. All of this was just more evident of a rogue Amelatuka. So Heather and I thanked Kembo and told him that we would head to examine the swamps tomorrow. Heather and I unloaded our stuff from the jeep and set up our small camping tent off the side of the clearing, a couple of hundred yards away from everyone else. Before we settled in to go to sleep, Ava came over and handed us a few copies of the marked GPS images she had shown us earlier. I had been thinking about getting a map before we set out the following day, but Ava said that this was the closest thing they had. That was fine. Heather and I had a GPS of our own. So, we could use the one that we had to get to the coordinates that Ava had given us. We said goodnight to Ava and settled into our tent for the night. It was hot and muggy, so we left the tent flap open, and Heather screened the opening with a small mosquito net, so we would be fine. By the light of our headlamps, she and I marked up the images that Ava had given us, planning on the direction that we would start our investigation in. There were no trails, paths, or roads where we were headed, so we would have to make our own way to the swamps, our first main objective. The images Ava gave us included some data on elevation and tree cover, and we used that to draw out a route that would pretty much take us through the lowlands and the clearings in the forest as much as possible. That way our progress would be faster, up until we would have to veer off into the thick jungle and marshy areas. So that was the plan and when we finished laying it out, we went to sleep. The sounds of frogs and insects were loud around us, but they made a great lullaby. The next morning I woke up before sunrise, feeling a little restless. I had not adjusted to the time zone change yet, Heather was still asleep, though, so I took the opportunity to sit on the grass outside and catch up writing my notes and journaling. I also took another look at our makeshift map again, to refresh my memory of the plan. At some point, I looked up across the clearing and saw a few shapes in the darkness. Cautiously, I turned on my headlamp to see a group of four large antelopes staring at me, their eyes reflecting whitish green from the light. They all had horns and gorgeous patterns of white stripes on dark brown fur. After staring for a while, they turned as one walked off into the shadows. These antelope were called bongos, and it was cool to see some local wildlife. The sun soon came up, illuminating the trees in the clearing with golden light. It was beautiful, and I took a few moments just to admire the sight of the quiet of the jungle in the morning. If it were not for the heat and humidity, I could see myself loving it there. Eventually, things in the camp and the jungle started to wake up. Birds began to call and sing, and the researchers began emerging from their tents and milling around. Heather woke up too and we started breaking down our tent and getting our supplies ready to go. Soon, Ava invited us over to the pavilion to have breakfast before we set out. We agreed and were in the middle of eating when it started to rain. It wasn't coming down terribly hard, but it was enough that our progress was going to be affected. I sighed and asked if anyone knew when the rain was going to let up. Unfortunately, nobody could really tell. Heather and I consulted and we both thought it would be best just to go, regardless of the rain. Our progress would be slowed down and we'd have to be careful, but it was only a couple of miles to the swamps. We had made sure to bring waterproof gear and clothing, so we would be fine as long as it wasn't flooding or anything too crazy. We said farewell to Ava, Kembo, and the other scientists, and they wished us good luck. Then we gathered our many pounds of supplies and headed out for the swamps. We started off trekking in a general northerly direction crossing the grassy clearings that were now becoming more of a muddy area because of the rain. Thankfully, Heather and I had nice thick boots, so the mud was just a minor annoyance. I will not bore you with the step-by-step -step story of our journey, but it was actually more pleasant than I thought it would be. It was obviously hot, but the rain made things actually more pleasant, because things were cooler. After about an hour, the rain stopped, giving us a bit of a break, 
The sun came out and started to warm things up as well. That didn't last long though, because after crossing a few clearings, we made our way northwest into the jungle. I'm assuming that most of you guys listening have probably never been into a tropical forest, but it's a very unique environment. The colors are not incredibly bright like you might see in cartoons. Mostly things are just brown and green. There are splashes of different colors here and there from fruits or flowers or fungus, but it's mostly brown bark and dirt along with green leaves and vines. There are thousands of plant species, the trees are enormous, and their broad leaves block out the sunlight, which meant that Heather and I were always in the shade as we went. That spared us from the direct sunlight, but of course, it was still humid and hot. Thankfully, there were not a ton of flies or mosquitoes, although I assumed that would change as we approached the swamps. As we got further into the forest, I began to find that walking along was easier than I expected, because the huge trees prevent almost all of the sunlight from reaching the forest floor. There aren't a ton of plants at the very bottom of the jungle. There are some bushes and shrubs, but it's a lot more open than you might think. The wildlife is also incredible. I have heard that half of all the world's species live in a tropical forest of some sort, and if you go there, you can see for yourself. As we walked through this jungle, Heather and I saw all kinds of animals. A tiny brown antelope called a bay diker spotted us at one point and went bounding away through the nearby brush. On another occasion, Heather spotted a green flapped neck chameleon on a branch, close enough that we could have grabbed it. The air around us was filled with bird song and insect calls. Warblers flitted through the air, and once we even noticed a perching hornbill with black and white feathers. I even spotted two weaver bird nests hanging down from a tree branch. We heard gray parrots squawking to each other in the distance a few times too. At one point we even had a stare off with a pair of gray furred, white nosed gunions called greater spot nosed monkeys. They looked to be young, maybe siblings. The curious little guys followed us through the trees for a bit until an older one, maybe their mom or dad, came up and pulled them away with a growl, which made Heather and I laugh. We saw a lot in those first hours of traveling, but I think you get the picture, so I'll skip ahead a bit. We eventually made it to the edge of the swamps, to a place where the ground started to get muddy and wet. The amount of undergrowth and brush was also beginning to increase, so I figured things were going to only get more difficult from here. We pulled out our map and tried to check our GPS coordinates, but the signal was practically non-existent due to the thick tree cover. I should have expected that but it was not entirely hopeless. We had a general idea of where we were, so we figured we would have to now try to find some sort of fresh sign that Amelatuka was around. As we walked, I thought of two strategies for how we might find the Amelatuka if we continued to have trouble tracking it. I brought these up to Heather. The first idea would be to locate some elephants or buffalo or maybe even hippos. If we stuck close to these animals, there was a chance that, eventually, one of them would do something to get on the Amelatuka's nerves. Then, when our target struck, we would strike back. The second idea was a bit riskier, at least for Heather and me. It involved luring the Amelatuka. For this idea, I suggested that we could go to a spot near where many of the killings had taken place. There. We could make our presence obvious by making a lot of noise and putting up lots of bright colors. If this lure worked as intended, then the Amelatuka would come to us and we could take it down. That might just be insane enough to work, Heather mused after I told her the second idea. I'll take that as a compliment, I guess, I replied as she ruffled my hair with a laugh. We figured that although the lure idea would be more dangerous, it would probably be a faster way and protect the animals more than the other plan. So we decided that if we could not track down the Amelatuka, we would try to lure it in. For the rest of that day, we continued to visit different kill sites around the edges of the swamp, looking for clues and signs. As I have said before, I am unbelievably bad with most technology, so I let Heather deal with the GPS and guide us around. She picked up our coordinates when and where if it was possible, which was usually in the clearings in the forest. 
Between the GPS and our makeshift map image, we were able to make our way to different sites where bodies had been found. Unfortunately, we were not able to turn up much. Most of the killings had happened at least a few days ago, and between the humidity, the rain, and the scavengers, there were very few remains, or tracks left. We found some bones, including some buffalo horns and small elephant tusk, but there were no footprints or scats. There were some fallen saplings, though, which left no doubt of our target's recent presence. The first night we camped on the edge of a clearing, taking turns on watch. The night was uneventful at first. I heard quite a bit of movement in the trees nearby at one point, but it did not sound like anything noticeably big. After being silent and holding still for a long time, I caught sight of a small sounder of giant forest hogs moving through the dense forest. I thought about waking Heather up to see them, but ultimately decided not to rob her of precious sleeping time. I think it was an hour or two later we first heard the Amelituka. I was sleeping in the tent when I was awoken by a distant sort of bellowing sound. It was kind of high-pitched and lasted only for a second. I could not describe it very well, but it almost sounded like an angry bull, if you have ever heard the bellowing roar of a cow or a bull. Heather came over to find me already awake, and we waited to see if we would hear the sound again. There was quite a bit of snapping and crashing in the trees, but it sounded pretty far off. A couple of seconds later, the bellowing came once again, and after a few more minutes, all the sound stopped for the rest of the night. It might have been an elephant or a hippo, but I had never heard either of those animals make a bellow sound quite like that. I just had a feeling it was something else. In any case, Heather and I agreed that the noise sounded like an animal in a state of heightened emotion. Maybe scared, angry, or even hurt. Neither of us were able to sleep for the rest of the night, so we stayed awake on watch together. Nothing else of note happened that night, so when the sun began to rise, we started getting ready to go. In the orange light of dawn, a herd of six buffalo came to graze on the other side of the clearing, eating their breakfast as we were eating ours. When we finished, we broke down camp and started packing up. Both Heather and I agreed that we should head northwest, which is the general direction from which we had heard the noises last night. We walked that way for a while, and before long we came up upon an area that had lots of trampled plant life and broken branches. Several small trees had been knocked over, and vines were strewn all around. Two of the larger trees around us were marked with vertical gashes where something had gouged at the trunks. The Amelituka had almost definitely been here, and judging from the level of destruction I had left behind, it was very angry indeed. Look at this. It must have pushed this whole thing down, Heather said, walking over to a very tall fallen tree with a trunk that was probably about four feet across. It seemed like the strength of the Amelituka was not exaggerated. The amount of damage the monster had caused seemed out of the ordinary, and I assumed that it was showing off or maybe even marking its territory. Maybe animals advertise their presence and their power by making lots of noise and causing damage to the environment around them. They may also mark their territory in similar ways. I did not know if the Melituka were territorial or not, but this could be evidence that they were. But I thought it was more likely that this cryptid was sick. The Amelituka has a reputation for being aggressive, of course, but the behavior of this one was unusually violent. That can be a sign of both physical and mental illness. Heather was not so sure, but in any case, we needed to find the creature. Luckily, it had left behind a clear trail of debris. We followed the broken branches and trampled leaves for a bit, and all the while the underbrush grew thicker and the ground got muddier. Before long, we were deep into the swamps, hopping and slogging from one patch of dry ground to another. The bugs were everywhere too, which annoyed me greatly. After a bit, I could hear moving water from ahead. Eventually, we came through a bunch of bushes onto a sunny embankment. We were on the edge of a slow-moving stream. Although the opposite bank was covered thickly in brush and reeds, the side we were on was a bit more open. This allowed us to see a group of big, grayish-black blobs lying on the bank, 
no more than a couple hundred feet away. At first, I thought we were looking at some boulders, but then I noticed a few wiggling ears. Before I could say anything or move, one of those so-called boulders stood up on all four legs and turned towards us, opening a wide mouth, huge saber teeth inside. We had walked right up onto a group of sleeping hippos, and it looked like one of them had gotten pretty offended. Back up, right now, Heather said quietly, and we immediately did just that. The hippo had gotten up and started to step towards us, grunting with its mouth still open. So we picked up the pace. Once we had gotten back into the tree line, we turned and ran in the opposite direction for a little bit before stopping. Once we had caught our breath, Heather burst out laughing, and after a few seconds, so did I. Sometimes you must be grateful that you were not chased down and mauled by an angry hippopotamus. And, if you think I'm joking, I'm absolutely not. Hippos can run as fast as a tractor, and they kill more people than lions every single year. Plus, they have enormous fangs and can weigh over two tons. Besides, leopards and the Amelatuka, they were probably the most dangerous thing in this area. However, the hippo's presence gave Heather and I an idea. It seemed that the Amelatuka came to that stream to drink, and when it did, the hippos would almost certainly react. We could stake out that trail that we had been following and make a lot of noise to lure in the Amelatuka. If it did not come before nightfall, we could just camp there and take turns on watch like we had done before. And all the while, the hippos would act to help as an early alarm system if they saw our target. First, we made sure that the hippos wouldn't come our way when they got up to feed at night. We looked around, but it did not seem that there was too much nearby that was good for hippos to eat. They would probably head downstream, south of us, to get food. That meant we probably would not have to worry about any hippos crashing into our camp at night. Next, we found a spot with good visibility and two sturdy climbable trees with big branches that overlooked the Amelatukas Trail. Heather and I both climbed one of the trees to test if they would support our weight and if we would be able to shoot down from their branches. We would run to these trees and climb them if we had to get away from the Amelatuka. Next, Heather and I took all of the most colorful clothing and other items we had. Unfortunately, it was not much because both Heather and I always pack clothes that can blend in with the natural world and the environment where we do our hunts. But we had a few things that were bright red or yellow, mainly underwear and t-shirts, as well as some assorted bandanas and rags. We tied cords between trees to form makeshift clotheslines and hung these colorful items on the lines so that they would be obvious from far away. Hopefully, the bright, artificial colors would help attract the Amelatuka's attention. We finished setting up the clothes a little before noon, so we had plenty of daylight left. The next step was to make a lot of noise and wait for the Amelatuka to come to us. We were right in the middle of the monster's apparent range, so sooner or later, it would have to notice us. I just hoped that it would respond aggressively, like we wanted it to. I also wished that we could have set some traps, which was when I got an idea. The ground was too wet and too soft for any kind of effective pit or trench, but I could put up some stakes around the area. I had brought my combat tomahawk along, and although it is not designed for woodworking, it does serve as a decent woodcutting axe if I have to. There were a lot of trees and logs all around the swamp that I could use, so while Heather set up our tent, and kept watch over the camp, I started to gather some wood. We alternated singing as time went on. Neither of us had great voices by any means, but it was a fun way to keep entertained and to create more of a disturbance like we wanted to. Heather mostly sung a bunch of traditional Irish stuff, which I thought sounded beautiful, but I am obviously biased. She also introduced me to U2, and they had quickly become our favorite band so we had a sing-along together from their albums for a while. At one point, I did a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner that I could barely finish because we were laughing so hard at how bad it was. The whole time, I chopped up a bunch of sturdy branches and logs, sharpening the ends to make stakes. I placed the stakes at a few key points along the trail and around the area, including some at the bases of our two escape trees, 
we would be able to swerve around them, but the Amelatuka probably would not. I did not expect the stakes to kill the monster, of course, but they could do some damage and slow it down. Eventually, the sun began to set, with no sign of our target. Heather and I were disappointed, but we just planned to do the same thing tomorrow. Before dinner, we made a quick run back to the river to see if the hippos were still there, which they were. I guess they had been able to tolerate our horrible singing. After checking our roly-poly friends, we headed back to the camp to eat and get ready for the night. When it was time to go to sleep, we took turns on watch as we had done before. Nothing much was happening until sometime early in the morning as the sky was slowly beginning to light up. I was standing watch when, from somewhere to the south, I heard hippos start to go nuts. Hippos make a lot of noise when they get angry, upset, or scared. Now, I've heard a whole lot of honking, wheezing, and squealing from where they were. It could have been a crocodile, or even just a fight, but I got a gut feeling that it was something more than that. I went to wake up Heather, but she was already out of the tent and grabbing her rifle. I took a few steps from out of the camp and realized I could hear movement in the foliage far away, but getting closer. Something big was coming in our direction. All right, let us get ready to run for the escape trees. Something's about to be on us, I told Heather. She nodded before grabbing me and kissing me hard. I love you, Sam. We can do this, she told me, and I remember seeing the determination in her expression, her pale skin glowing even in the low light. We've got this, I replied, and I meant every word of it. We turned back to the trees, where the movement was getting closer. What happened next was very fast and very chaotic, so I'll do my best to describe it as I remember. First, a pair of hippos came crashing through the trees ahead of us, their eyes glowing red in the light from our headlamps. I think it was probably a mom and her baby, but a young one and an adult. The hippos slowed down upon catching sight of us in our camp, and then the full-grown one swerved to the side, west towards the river, and ran off that way. The baby kind of stumbled for a second, then rushing after the adult, and they went splashing through the mud away from us. Around then, I noticed the sounds from directly ahead of us. They still hadn't stopped, and something was still coming right for us. Then I saw the huge seven-foot-tall shape barreling towards us, and I raised my gun. The Amelatuka came into full view only a second later, its light brown body coming through the trees only a few hundred feet away. It looked straight at Heather and I, and I saw its ear-like frills flap out on either side of its head, flushing red with its blood as the creature gave a low rumble. I think Heather and I fired pretty much at the same time, aiming for the Amelatuka's small black eyes. The cryptid flinched and staggered backwards with a surprised squeal, then immediately lowered its enormous horn and began charging forwards. Heather and I both turned and started sprinting for our trees as fast as we could. I made sure to weave around the stakes as I ran, trying to put them between me and the monster. I could feel the ground shaking underfoot and hear the snorting breaths of the Amelatuka as it charged, but a few seconds later, I reached my tree and started climbing. It was hard with my rifle in hand, but soon enough I hauled myself up to a big branch where I had been perched earlier. As I grabbed the branch, I heard the Amelatuka bellow. As I got up onto my perch, the entire tree shook as the huge beast slammed into it. Gunfire cracked out from Heather's tree, and the Amelatuka roared. I looked down to see the creature ram its horn into my tree again, and I heard a very concerning sound, splintering wood. The Amelatuka had smashed through several of the stakes, and I saw at least two of the sharpened logs sticking out of its scaly hide. But they did not seem to phase it, because the massive creature was still highly active. It backed up a few steps and looked up to me, before lowering its head again and ramming the tree hard. The tree lurched to the side, and I heard it began to groan. I had thought that this tree would hold up, but I was quickly beginning to reconsider that. I adjusted my grip on the rifle and fired once more at it. I got it right in the neck. It roared and stepped backwards, tossing its head up and down. I had heard it, but that was not going to kill it. I did not have a clean shot of any of the creature's vulnerable areas. A few shots came from Heather's direction and I heard her give a loud whistle. She was trying to get the monster's attention, 
and although it looked like a couple of her shots caused the Amelatuka to flinch, the cryptid seemed to set on taking my tree down. It charged again, ramming my tree at full speed, and I saw chips of bark and wood go flying from the impact. The tree shook, and I felt it noticeably begin to tilt. One or more charges, and this tree would be down. We did not have much time. I continued firing until I had to reload, still aiming for the back of the Amelatuka's neck. Between the bullet wounds and the stakes, the monster's light brown scales were red with blood, but neither Heather nor I had been able to land a kill shot. It was wounded and furious, and as I reloaded, it rammed the tree again. I felt the tree sway underneath me, and the Amelatuka reared up onto its hind legs. It pressed its front feet onto the tree trunk and started to push. I finished reloading and managed to shoot a few times at the monster's head, but now I had to worry about gravity. The Amelatuka had started to push the tree backwards, and I was falling along with it. The tree started to collapse completely, and I braced myself against the trunk and got ready to jump. When the tree trunk was about 45 degree angle from the ground, I jumped off. I only fell about five or six feet, and the muddy ground helped cushion my pain and started running towards Heather's direction. I didn't know exactly what I was trying to do, but I was hoping she would be able to get a better shot if I lured the cryptid towards her. I turned and saw the Amelatuka still thrashing around near the toppled tree, tossing leaves and dirt into the air with its horn. It probably had lost me after I jumped off the tree, since I had been able to get at least a hundred feet away from it. Now was the best chance. I raised my rifle and shouted as loud as I could. The monster whipped around to look at me, flaring its frills, and both Heather and I fired at the same time, right at the creature's eyes and face. The Amelatuka gave another high-pitched squeal, staggering noticeably. It lowered its head to charge me again, but after taking only a few steps forward, it began to stumble and eventually collapsed onto its side. It did not get up. I let out a sigh of relief and staggered over to Heather's tree. She clambered down and instantly started checking me for wounds or injuries. I'm okay, just a little shaken. I'm fine, I told her. She looked noticeably more relieved when I said that. Are you sure? Can I give you a hug? She asked, and I nodded. We hugged each other tightly for a moment, and then went over to check out the fallen cryptid. The Amelatuka was massive, and we found out that it was nearly 26 feet long from nose tip to tail tip when we measured it. Its scales were a uniform light brown color, the shade of coffee when it had been mixed with milk. When I do not have a tan, my own skin tone is about the same color, and much like me, this Amelatuka had quite a few scars across its body. Many of the scars were big and looked like they had been caused by elephant tusk, hippo teeth, and other horns of other Amelatukas. Speaking of which, this creature's horn was almost four feet long and it was covered in dents and scratches from all the damage it had done over the years. Unfortunately, it can be hard to tell the sex of reptiles, and it's not much different with the Melatuka. However, from what we could tell, the one we killed was likely a male. We guessed that he was probably an old and angry creature, venting his rage on anything that got close to him or disturbed him. Maybe a younger and stronger Amelatuka had even pushed him away from a better territory or mating opportunities. In any case, he was no longer a threat. The body was too big to bury, and we were not going to risk starting a fire to burn it. It seemed the body was just fine there, and we let nature take care of things. We retrieved our bullets from the body where we could, took a few chips of horn and patches of skin for analysis by our guides, and then decided to just leave it be. Between the climate and the scavengers, the jungle would dispose of everything quite quickly. We headed back to the research base, where there was a working phone line, and contacted the nearest hunter cleanup crew. They were north in Cameroon, but we gave them GPS coordinates and the Amelatuka's body, and they said they would get their ASAP. The researchers were concerned about Heather and I, but we reassured them that we were fine, and more importantly, the animals they were researching would be fine too. We did not tell them what had happened and they seemed to be wary, but they didn't really ask. It did not matter now if they did not really trust us. We had helped them out, and that is all we really came here for. I think both Heather and I would have stayed in the area for a while more, because there was so much to see. Unfortunately, we had probably overstayed our welcome with the scientist, and we could not just go camping on our own if we weren't on a job, 
because I'm pretty sure that's not allowed in that area. Plus, there were other dangerous animals in the forest besides rogue cryptids. So we said goodbye to everyone, and Kembo drove us back to Brazzaville, where we grabbed a hotel. We toured the city for a little bit more, heading back to the US, and that was that. I would definitely love to go back to the Republic of the Congo sometime, because despite my short stay, it was a beautiful place with a lot of experience. Anyway, that's about all I've got for you guys this time. We are nearing the end of these letters, and I've got an intense and scary one I plan to write for the next time. It is also going to be sad, but that is all I will say for now. It is probably going to take me a good while to finish it, but I think it will be good for everyone to share. For now, I am just enjoying reading your questions and thoughts, so thanks again for all your comments, keep them up, and we will talk soon. This has been Sam White Owl, signing out.